experience is what makes these releases so special. But do you know what's also special? Shaving your balls with Manscaped, the global men's lifestyle brand that's revolutionizing the way that we think about men's grooming. I did not expect. <laughs> I'd like that on Mad Season 1. From Mad Season Show. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. It, because, I mean, it's if it's been a part of you for, like, almost your whole life. Then it feels like home, right? Instrumental play, on the other hand, oh. different. <laughs> Laddie, is... I I have a difficult time probably relating to this, but to me it looks it sounds very controversial, and for that reason I'm intrigued, because well, like why World of Warcraft has become so toxic. I have nothing but the love for the game currently. I love War Within. It is the best expansion I've ever played. It is. It hundred percent is retail version wise. From and then that like, like from all sort of vanilla and TBC and Wrath has its own thing, obviously. But the best game, like as far as the structure of it. <sighs> yeah, War Within. But why World of Warcraft has become toxic? May maybe he's talking retail, maybe he's talking in general, or maybe he's just talking classic. I know his focus is way more classic driven, so. But here we go. Word night. When discussing toxic communities, there are a handful of games out there that immediately come to mind. League of Legends is almost universally recognized for its <laughs> intense and Very sometimes true. hostile player base. It's a game where the competition is fierce and the stakes feel high, leading to interactions that are often uh, less than friendly. Call of Duty, another giant in the gaming world, is known for its cutthroat nature. It's a game where players are often pitted against one another in highly competitive environments, and this too can lead to toxicity. And mm -hmm. Counter-Strike, with its emphasis on precision and skill, has a community that can be quite unforgiving to newcomers <laughs> or then, those yeah. perceived as That was fake, right? Skilled. I remember. And then, there's World of Warcraft, a game that's been around for nearly two decades with a community that's seen its fair share of ups and downs. You'll find many websites that list these games as having toxic communities, but they often move on without much explanation. The goal of this uh -huh. video today is to go beyond the surface and to really explore and answer this question. Why is World of Warcraft considered toxic? Let me, I'm going to add a little bit of a, like keywords to this, okay? I'm assuming DDKP is one of the things. Botting is another. Um, buying wild WoW gold, token, or other, uh, you know, options of buying gold. Those are three. Um, yeah. What is it about this game that's cultivated such a reputation over its near 20-year legacy? What the fuck? The releases in the entertainment world are exhilarating. There's a certain magic to them, almost an addictive quality that pulls you in and keeps you engaged. Getting caught up in the frenzy of a new phenomenon, whether it's a movie, Sweden. TV show, or video game is an experience like none other it's as if you're being whisked away <laughs> to this new world a new experience that feels fresh and exciting the story progresses new features are introduced and mysteries that have been lingering on for years might finally be resolved the fan base collectively gets lost in the unfolding narrative sharing in the excitement and the joy of discovery and it's this communal experience is what makes these releases so special. But do you know what's also special? Shaving your balls with Manscaped, the global men's lifestyle brand that's revolutionizing the way that we think about men's grooming. 
I mean, when you've got the confidence of more than 10 million men worldwide, in other words, more than 20 million testicles shaved, you know they're doing something right. These communities may be toxic, but your crotch isn't. With the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, featuring the brand new Lawnmower Electric Trimmer, which takes grooming precision to a whole new level. This bad boy comes with dual skin safe blade heads, an upgraded trimmer blade for those clean cut moves, and an interchangeable foil blade that leaves you with a super smooth and bare finish. And with a bigger LED light and waterproof design, you're covered whether you're in the shower or out. The Performance 5.0 Ultra package includes the Weed Whacker 2.0 for easy nose and ear hair oh trimming. God, the kit also whacker. comes with the Crop Soother Aftershave Lotion and the Preserver Anti-Chafing Deodorant. They're essentially world buffs for your testicles. And don't forget the free gifts. The Boxers 2.0 and the Shed 2.0 oh bag for God. ultimate comfort and organization. Get your performance package 5.0 Ultra today at manscaped.com with my code MSS20 for 20% off soothing. and also free shipping and these two free gifts. Your balls will thank you. <clears throat> I did not expect <laughs> I'd like that on my season well. On my season show. <laughs> Anyways, a few categories of well of Warcraft players don't think about their balls hygiene, let me just tell you that. ...of entertainment deliver this feeling more intensely than the MMORPG. Not the ball trimming, I'm talking about the excitement over this new experience. It is a genre where the allure lies in an online world that isn't just yours, but is shared with countless others from across the globe. The world is persistent, it's always alive, with things happening in every corner even when you're not logged in. It is this virtual reality that continues to exist and evolve even when you're not present. For some, it even becomes a second life, a place where they can escape from the stresses of the real world and immerse themselves in an alternate reality. Much like other forms of entertainment, the initial period after an MMO's release is dominated by the desire to experience the game rather than to achieve specific goals. This period is defined by what is called free play as opposed to instrumental play. In 1993, a German educational theorist and psychologist, Wolfgang Eiser, contributed to the understanding of these types of play within the context of child development and educational theory. He described free play as the most natural and uninhibited form of play. It's spontaneous, unstructured, and self-directed, driven by curiosity and imagination. There are no rules or objectives imposed by others. Mm -hmm. Only intrinsic motivation guides the activity. For instance, a child building a fort out of cushions and blankets isn't doing so with a specific goal in mind. There's no reward waiting at the end. The child is simply exploring, creating, that looks and having fun, hella and fun, lost in the joy of the moment. Instrumental play, on the other hand, is structured and goal-oriented. It often comes with external instructions or objectives with a clear end goal in sight, and while it can still be enjoyable, the focus shifts towards achieving a particular result such as a classroom activity where children are tasked with solving a puzzle. The aim is to complete the puzzle correctly, which usually involves following rules and employing logic. So whereas the satisfaction from free play comes from participating in the activity itself, mm -hmm. in instrumental play, it most often comes from the sense of accomplishment that follows achieving this specific goal. Free yeah. play is seen as crucial for holistic development. It fosters creativity, problem solving, and social skills. When left to their own devices, individuals can create these entire worlds and characters and stories. And in the case of World of Warcraft, this type of play is most often seen in the world of role-playing, where players immerse themselves in the lore and they create their own narratives within the game's universe. Yeah. In a sense, they're not just playing the game. And those people got bullied. They're living. I mean, to be fair, there were like servers named for role play, so I mean, it's a big community out there for sure. And it and creating oh, their awesome. own stories and adventures as they go along. Instrumental play, on the other hand, yeah. different, <laughs> <Laddie>. <laughs> is equally valuable. 
It helps develop specific skill sets and it fosters critical thinking, following rules and working towards a goal and focusing on achieving a particular outcome requires discipline, focus, and perseverance. Hell yeah. Let's go. Yeah, nice shit. These Good skills shit. are crucial both in real life and in these virtual worlds that we inhabit. And in World of Warcraft, an example of instrumental play would be raiding, where players work together to overcome difficult challenges, requiring coordination, strategy, and a deep understanding of the game's mechanics. During the birth of a new movie series, or video game, or fandom of any sort, exploration and curiosity often overshadow this objective-based play. In other words, free play takes precedence over instrumental play. This is a very natural progression, as the initial thrill lies in the discovery and the novelty of the experience rather than achieving specific outcomes. It's a time when the world feels open and full of possibilities, and where the joy comes from the journey rather than the destination. Although both types of play mm. are essential, free play has an advantage, especially in terms of community dynamics. It's less intense because there are no objectives at stake. Without specific goals, the game lacks a competitive edge, which can lead to a more relaxed and welcoming environment. I don't know about, like, like just in general, the way I felt about leveling back then, I kind of enjoyed it. Then, once you'd done that a couple times, you were just tired and wanted to get to max level. So, in that sense, that sort of feeling dies out relatively quick, the sort of free play. Um. Yeah, I see both sides to this. A lot of people just preach the whole free play in the beginning and just the leveling journey to it in itself is worth playing. And yeah, sure, there's raiding, but what about the leveling part? Like everyone just sort of like, not everyone, a lot of people just love that part. But I think I was on that side when I was younger. And then when I got older, I just like, okay, max level, here we go. I want to see the end content because that's where it's at. Whereas other people were like, yeah, there's end content, but that's the end, and this is where it's at what, with the leveling and everything. But as time passes, and this initial exploration phase ends, the free play dynamic wanes, and objective-based play, and consequently, instrumental play, start to take over. Yeah. Where there once were no conditions to win, the need to achieve victory at all costs begins to dominate. The fun is no longer about simply experiencing the dungeon, it's about completing it as quickly and as efficiently as possible. This shift introduces yeah. a level of pressure to perform well and often to impose that same pressure on the teammates. And it's no longer just about enjoying the game, it's about proving your worth both to yourself and to others. Don't go in the defile. Get out of the defile. Are you defile. kidding me? Come on! It is at this point that elitism begins to creep in. Those who don't meet certain standards can be <laughs> oh, excluded shit. or looked down upon, creating an environment that becomes increasingly divisive. And what was once a collaborative and inclusive experience has now turned into a competitive and exclusionary one. Players who were once welcomed with open arms may find themselves now ostracized or criticized for not meeting the ever-increasing demands of the game and its player base. But I'll challenge that with this, though. If it's so toxic and everything, why don't you just go level another character that you like? Why, do, why don't you just do what you sort of love to do? Free play dies out if you decide for it to die out. I said previously that the whole thing of like if you level one character and then you level another and then another sooner or later it becomes tiresome but if that's what you love then just keep doing that then um also rating wise not all guilds are like this the top one two four ten percent are like this hundred percent but uh not every all the guilds there's a place for everyone, to some degree. While game developers don't directly control player behavior, they do largely guide it. As a game becomes more and more solved, 
and the collective interest of the player base shifts towards goal-oriented instrumental play, developers may mm -hmm. start implementing systems and features that cater to this new focus. The quality of a player's gear becomes immediately discernible and boiled down to a number, and metrics like what dungeons or raids they've completed and how efficiently they've done so are now built into the game itself. Yeah, with the Mythic 100%, I can give an example. I tried to queue for some Mythics yesterday. I, uh, I'm a good player with some good gear. Because they don't have the rating for the season, um, I'm not getting in. I tried for like an hour and a half. Couldn't. I couldn't get one. I even tried to create the group myself with my Keystone. That didn't work either. On a Saturday. That's kind of yikes. In that sense, you need to group up with friends. To boost your rating and then all of a sudden you can do a hug and, and everything and then all of a sudden like oh my god this guy has that much rating holy shit yes oh, yeah. this creates an environment that allows for the immediate filtering of the good players from the bad and the optimal from the suboptimal and where you once might have taken a player along a dungeon run because they were funny or enjoyable to be around you now might replace that same player with a personality of dark side phil who does 20% more damage Dark and then max and <laughs> optimized objective-based gameplay can be fun in its own right the focus begins to shift towards it in almost every aspect of the game often at the expense of the community spirit that wants to find it such as the natural course of all multiplayer games because the problem lies not necessarily with their design as much as it does with our competitive human nature yes, yes. Game designers can take measures to slow this process, and there have been documented cases of them doing so, such as in Final Fantasy XIV, another MMO, where damage meters are allowed only for personal use and are against the game's terms of service to broadcast them to other players or oh. shame someone for performing suboptimally. Where there are choices, there are those that are right and those that are wrong. If there is a win condition, it is possible to lose, and the foundation of World of Warcraft in particular is built upon these fundamentals, player agency, and achievements. Even if it isn't directly, the players are competing against one another in some way. Who has the best gear? Who does the most damage? Who has the highest parse? Who has more mounts? Who has the coolest mount? Who has this cool looking rare armor set? Who has more gold? Who has more achievement points? max level characters, PvP ranking, and so on and so forth. Your performance in the game is directly compared to others playing it. It is an environment crafted specifically for instrumental play and for all of its strengths. A wholesome community is transitory, existing only for a brief period of time when it is new and the players are preoccupied with experiencing it rather than experiencing it correctly. Such is the fate of not only World of Warcraft, but of most MMORPGs and, by extension, most multiplayer games. The answer to mm. why the World of Warcraft community has become toxic, at least in part, lies in the passage of time. Yeah, it's bound to happen, though. Like... It's not actually a reaction. Oh, it's gorgeous. <laughs> In all forms of entertainment, not just MMOs, and not even just video games, there's a certain measure of investment that comes from three key resources. Money, time, and emotion. These three elements are the foundation of our engagement with the things that we love and they play a significant role in shaping our experiences and our communities. You pay your hard-earned money to play the game, to watch the movie, to attend a sporting event, and you spend your valuable time interacting with it, investing countless hours into whatever form of entertainment that you're passionate about. And over time, if you enjoy it enough, you might even become emotionally attached to it in some significant way. And it's this emotional investment is what most often makes these experiences meaningful and memorable. But it can also be the source of conflict and tension within communities. Time and money are straightforward. You spend them and they're gone. 
but emotion is where things get more complicated. Most of us are guilty of reminiscing fondly about that nostalgic game series from our childhoods. Yeah, I mean, classic WoW in itself is just a great example of this. Or that unforgettable football game we attended. Or maybe, perhaps, when we first saw Star Wars on the big screen. These experiences... Yeah, when the guy, when, I uh, can't remember the name, of the Alan Brackman or whatever, it's like, some of you like vanilla and... and you... <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> Uh, and then they released the trailer. Holy shit. It evokes strong emotional responses, and we carry them with us long after the event has passed. They become a part of who we are, and they help shape our identities and relationships with others. MMOs, however, are a unique case. They are a particularly hardcore genre of game in terms of investment. They're expensive, requiring expansions every couple of years. World of Warcraft, for instance, still has a monthly subscription fee just to play, on top of a pretty intense cash shop for cosmetics and progression. Told you so, by the way. It's a financial commitment that not every gamer is willing or able to make, but for those who do, it's a significant investment. The genre is also incredibly time-consuming. MMOs are built on the foundation that there is no end, that the content is continuously added in order to keep players engaged and, more importantly, subscribed. Yeah. World of Warcraft, for example, just released its 10th expansion and will be celebrating its 20th anniversary this November. Some players have been playing it for the entirety of the game's lifespan, dedicating years of their lives and thousands of dollars to exploring Azeroth and all it has to offer. 20 years of memories, trials, tribulations, successes, failures, friends, enemies, and emotional investment. For many, World of Warcraft has become more than just a game. It's yeah. If, because, I mean, it's if it's been a part of you for, like, almost your whole life, then it feels like home, right? It's a comfort activity, a consistent and everyday part of their lives that provides a sense of stability in a world that is often unpredictable and chaotic. It's something that they can rely on. It's something that's been there through the good times and the bad. And this deep connection only strengthens their investment into the game. Time, money, and emotion. This intense investment creates an equally intense community where some players attach their identity to the game, while on the other hand, perhaps due to its addictive nature, have attached their identity to disliking it. As stated, mm. MMOs are built upon the fundamental principle of change. New features, systems, classes, land masses, and so on are constantly introduced, removed, or otherwise altered for better or for worse. And the result is a community that is often at odds with itself, divided between those who love the game and those who love to hate what it has become. In recent years, there's been a lot of negativity surrounding Blizzard, the developer for World of Warcraft. From laying off a record number of employees after a record-breaking fiscal financial quarter, to releasing unfinished games, facing human rights controversy. World of Warcraft Reforged, yeah, holy fuck. These poor expansion releases and even lawsuits, Blizzard has been thrust into a whirlwind of controversy. This has led to an abundance of criticism and negativity, with Blizzard becoming something of a punching bag for journalists and documentarians and the gaming community as a whole. And while much of it is deserved, this constant barrage of criticism has also created a bandwagon effect where much of this negativity surrounding the game and the developer is either overdone or done in bad faith. It has long since reached a point where there is now pushback with longtime fans of the game who have invested so much of themselves into it, fighting back with what they perceive as equally personal toxicity. This defensiveness is understandable, but it also contributes to the toxic environment that has become synonymous with the game. This phenomenon isn't unique to World of Warcraft. It's true of any long-running game or series, but it's particularly pronounced in MMOs due to the intense time and financial commitments required. It's not just a random Call of Duty match. It's an adventure that spans decades for some players. There's so much more to attach yourself to in the MMO genre, which makes the community dynamics even more charged, and therefore the potential for toxicity 
even higher. And the result is a mix of toxic positivity and toxic negativity. The fanboys versus the haters. Those who treat the game like, <laughs> like a girlfriend versus those who treat it like an ex-girlfriend. Meanwhile, a potential new player who is ignorant of all of this looks on in confusion and embarrassment. World of Warcraft, League of Legends, Dota, Counter-Strike. These are games and franchises that have been around longer than some of you have been alive. Yep. They've Not me, though. Become staples, comforts, and significant parts of the player base's identity. When you combine this with the shift from free play to instrumental play and the hyper optimization and metagaming that follows, it creates an environment that many today consider to be toxic and unwelcoming. And while the nature and structure of these games plays a role, what's truly responsible for the decline in the quality of these communities is our competitive human nature and our tendency to invest too much of ourselves into our passions, whether that be movies, sports, TV shows, or video games like World of Warcraft, the problem is the same. It's not just about the games themselves, it's about how we as oh, people no. interact with them and the communities that form around them. There was actually none of it that I, uh, that I thought it would be. Um... But yeah, damn. <laughs> but can't you remain ignorant and just do what you want? But in 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 yeah, yeah World of Warcraft has become toxic. I mean, there's there's a. I feel like at least with the war with the war within, they've sort of really catered to both audiences there, in a really good way. 